Hi everyone, Rob from Coding Concepts here, and in today's video, we'll be learning about the domain-driven design concept of entities. As always, if you find this content useful, please remember to like and subscribe, as it really helps us to reach more people and to continue to bring you more Coding Concepts videos. Thanks for watching, and let's get into it. What is an entity? An entity, as defined by Eric Evans in his book, Domain Driven Design, Tackling Complexity in Software, are objects not fundamentally defined by their attributes, but rather by a thread of continuity and identity. There are two important principles to understand when working with entities. They maintain a thread of continuity and they are defined by their identity. Maintain a thread of continuity. Continuity is defined as the unbroken and consistent existence or operation of something over a period of time. What this means is our entities will always be changing. They are mutable. They will have a history of what has happened to them and how they have changed over time. Thus, we must make it the entity's responsibility to manage the object's state and life cycle. This typically means we will be interested in tracking, locating, retrieving, and storing an entity state. Let's look at a simple example. Say we have an order tracking system for an online store. Consider the typical actions a customer may take. Place an order, return, cancel, or save an order for a future purchase. The actions a customer may take against an order is unpredictable and unbroken. Maybe they will start an order and immediately delete it. Or perhaps they will return it, or maybe they are building a cart to plan a larger purchase. But no matter the actions the customer ultimately decides to take against their order, it's the entity's responsibility to manage the consistent existence of that object over its lifetime, no matter how long that ends up being. defined by their identity. Identity can be defined as the characteristics determining who or what a person or thing is. Let's consider two simple examples which illustrates the importance of this principle. Say we have two bank deposits for the same amount at the same time of day. Are these deposits the same? Does our fictional bank now have $100 or $200? Do we need to reject one of these transactions? Is one of them a duplicate? Or let's look at another example. Consider we have Jim Smith from New York and another Jim Smith from New York. Are these the same person? When we look at these two examples from a conceptual level, it's possible that there are two different Jim Smiths living in New York. It's also possible that there are two transactions for the same amount on the same date. What these examples illustrate is while these objects share the same attributes, they are defined by their identities. Identities are constant. While the attributes of these objects can and will change over time, their identities do not. Your identity fundamentally cannot change. It is immutable. These are still the same people and the same transactions. When an object is defined by its identity, we should model them as entities in our domain. Identity 
generation. When creating our entities, we must create an identity for them so they can be effectively tracked in our system. There typically is two different ways of handling generating identity with different trade-offs and considerations. The first is to have the code itself generate the identity. The other is have the database generate the identity. The first technique is to have the application fulfill the responsibility of identity generation. You might choose this option if your unique identifier needs to be public or the requirements for the identity go beyond a simple integer. A good example of this might be a tracking number for an order shipment. The identity requirements in this scenario are more complex and go beyond a simple int. In this case, it makes sense to have the application generate the identity. The second approach is to have a persistence layer such as a database handle the identity creation for you. A common implementation is to have the database generate an incremental integer for you to represent the identity of your entity. This is great if you need an identity that is internal to the system. The benefit of this approach is in its simplicity as it's generally more performant as database performance favors integers for keys. No matter what design decisions you make, I recommend you err on the side of simplicity. Remember, there's always a cost to introducing complexity. Adhere to the YAGNI principle, which stands for, you aren't going to need it. Let the requirements of your domain drive your design decisions. In working with entities, there are four best practices that we should follow. Use the factory pattern for object creation. Prefer private setters with methods to update. Use a base entity class and apply the single responsibility principle to entity modeling. Use the factory pattern for object creation. The factory pattern is a pattern that is responsible only for object creation. We use the factory pattern to ensure we're creating an object in an always valid state. As our objects become more complex, the task of creating objects in a valid state becomes more difficult. This means it's usually best to offload this responsibility to a specific method or class. Another benefit of using the factory pattern is that it centralizes the business logic and dependencies needed to create the object. This simplifies our entities and helps keep them lean. When utilizing this pattern, be sure you're using private constructors and force all object creation to our factory methods. Our constructors should do minimal work and should generally just capture the parameters needed for object creation. Be sure to not clutter your constructors with business logic and prefer public factory methods with private constructors. Prefer private setters with public methods to update entities. Using private setters with public methods allows us to control the updating of our entities and enforce our business logic. This ensures our entities never enter an invalid state. Consider an order entity with a collection of order items. If we just expose a collection of order items, it's not clear the actions or behaviors that we expect. Compare this to public methods such as add item to order, remove item to order, and refund order. The intention and behaviors of the entity are clear. 
If we allow public setters, the entity can change at any time for any reason and can circumvent our business logic and invariance. We'll lose control over the life cycle of the entity and it can easily enter an invalid state. Using public methods with private setters makes our code more descriptive. It communicates the design decisions and behavior within our domain and makes the dependencies needed to make a proper update to our entity known through the parameters of the methods. Use a base entity class. Another best practice is to use a base entity class. As you're building out your entities in your domain, this is something that just naturally rises to the surface. You will find that there will be opportunity to centralize some of our entity logic in its own entity base class. We generally want to use a base entity class because it helps us adhere to the dry principle, which stands for don't repeat yourself. We want to be able to handle our identity logic in one class and not have to deal with this requirement in every entity we create. By centralizing this logic in our base entity class, we're able to share common code, such as identity creation, throughout all of our entities. Apply the single responsibility principle to entity modeling. Robert C. Martin defines the single responsibility principle as a class should have one and only one reason to change. By thinking of our entity modeling through the lens of the single responsibility principle, it serves to provide clarity to the entity. It makes it easier for us to determine what should naturally be part of the entity and what should be put elsewhere. It makes our entities easier to explain, understand, and implement. Evans states that we should strip the entity's definition down to the most intrinsic characteristics, particularly those that identify it or are commonly used to find or match it. Consider an example of determining if a book is in stock at a bookstore. As we're modeling our book entity for this problem, it seems reasonable to put properties such as title, author, and ISBN number. In our book entity, it might seem reasonable to add an additional property of in stock to track if the book is actually in stock. But if we think about this within the context of the single responsibility principle, it becomes clear that it shouldn't be the responsibility of the book itself to determine if it's in stock or not. That is not a characteristic of the book. In this example, it's more appropriate to move that responsibility elsewhere. Let's summarize the principles and best practices for entities. They maintain a thread of continuity. Our entities will always be changing. They are mutable. They will have a history of what happened to them and how they have changed over time. It's the entity's responsibility to manage the object's state and life cycle. This means we will be interested in tracking, locating, retrieving, and storing the entity's state defined by their identity. Identities are constant. While the attributes of an object can and will change over time, their identities do not. Your identity fundamentally cannot change. It is immutable. Entities with the same ID are considered equal, even if their attributes are different. Identity generation. There are generally two ways to handle identity generation, through the entity itself or through the use of a persistence layer. If your unique identifier needs to be public 
or the requirements are complex, having the entity be responsible for the identity generation may be a good choice. A good example of this is an order tracking number. On the other hand, if you just need a simple identity created that can be internal to the system, using a persistence layer to generate the identity may be the best choice. This is typically done through an incremental int. Use the factory pattern for object creation. This ensures we're creating an object in an always valid state. It centralizes the business logic and dependencies needed to create the entity. This also helps keep our entities lean. Prefer private setters with public methods to update entities. This allows us to control the updating of our entities and enforce our business logic to ensure our entities never enter an invalid state. It makes our code more descriptive and it communicates the design decisions and behavior within our domain. Use a base entity class. This helps us adhere to the dry principle. It also enables us to handle our identity logic in one place. Apply the single responsibility principle to entity modeling. This serves to provide clarity to the entity. It makes it easier for us to determine what should naturally be part of the entity and what should be put elsewhere. It makes our entities easier to explain, understand, and implement. Thanks for watching. I really hope you found some value inside this video. And if that's the case, please remember to like, share, and subscribe as it really helps the channel and for us to bring you more coding concept videos. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.